Okay, can I um, call the meeting to order and welcome everyone to this, the sixth meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2019. We have apologies from Brian Whittle and Maurice Corey is attending as committee substitute, so welcome. Um, perhaps can I take this chance too, to, um, before we begin proper proceedings, to congratulate Maria Lyle, who's part of our clerking team and also a world and Paralympic medalist and has great athletic success at European level as well. We're very proud of the fact that she was awarded the Young Scots Woman of the Year um, last week. We want to pass on our congratulations and take some of the reflected glory um, as, a, as a committee. Um, we have um, one item on the agenda this morning was a consideration of three continued petitions. The first petition is petition 1667, lodged by W. Hunter Watson, which calls for a review of mental health incapacity legislation in Scotland. At a previous consideration of this petition in October 2018, we agreed to invite the Minister for Mental Health to give oral evidence. Members will be aware that on Tuesday of this week, in advance of today's evidence session this petition, the Minister for Mental Health made a statement to the Parliament announcing an overarching review which will examine the full legislative framework that supports and protects people with a mental disorder. The Minister has also written to the committee with further detail on the review. This appears to deliver on the action called for in the petition and also appears to pick up on concerns and regular comments by members of this committee about the number of mental health related petitions we have seen recently coming before us. The petitioner has subsequently indicated that he very much welcomes the Minister's statement and hopes to be given an opportunity to respond to the forthcoming consultation about the reform of the 2003 Mental Health Act so that he may raise the many issues that concern him. Members of a copy of the petitioner's email to the clerks to that effect. Notwithstanding her statement to the Parliament and her letter to the committee, the Minister is here to give evidence to the committee this morning, and this might allow us to draw out some further information on the review. Um, and the Minister is accompanied by Theresa Medhurst, Deputy Director of Adult Mental Health, John Mitchell, Senior Medical Advisor, and Kirsty McGrath, Head of the Adults with Incapacity Review Team. Can I thank you all for attending this morning? And Minister, given that you delivered your statement to the Parliament on Tuesday, I wonder if you wish to add anything further by way of an opening statement to the committee. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. And yes, uh, with your indulgence, I, I will give an opening statement. Um, as you mentioned uh, earlier, um, I announced to Parliament on Tuesday that in order to strengthen support for people with mental health conditions, we will undertake an independent review of the Mental Health Act. Taken together with the ongoing work on capacity and adult support and protection legislation, we now have a comprehensive programme of activity amounting to an overarching review of the legislative framework affecting people with a mental disorder. The vast majority of people who access mental health services do so on a voluntary basis. Relatively few people are ever treated for a mental disorder against their will. If they are, it is because it is necessary to protect them or to protect the public um, or other people. People with a mental disorder may also be affected by the Adults with Incapacity or the Adult Support and Protection Acts. Um, and depending on their needs, a person may be subject to one, two or all three of these acts. This may be confusing for the individual and their carers and also create barriers to those caring for their health and welfare. While huge advances have taken place in relation to mental health in terms of treatment and changing social attitudes, we have also always been clear that we will continue to keep the changing context under review to ensure our legislation is fit for purpose. In recent years, there has also been an increasing focus in all areas of public life on the importance of protecting and promoting human rights and on recognising the rights of people with disabilities. This has provided us with an opportunity to look again at our legislation to ensure that the rights and protections of those with a mental disorder are fully respected. The Scottish Government is absolutely committed to bringing change to people's lives and ensuring that mental health is given parity with physical health. This review of the Mental Health Act will take this a step further, reaffirming our commitment to creating a modern, inclusive Scotland which protects, respects and realises internationally recognised human rights. I mentioned that we have already begun, to work, uh, begun work to review incapacity law and practice, as well as the review of learning disability and autism under the Mental Health Act, and will shortly be undertaking work on the Adult Support and Protection Act. 
This latest review will build on and be complementary to this ongoing work, resulting in an overarching review of the leg legislative framework affecting people with mental disorder. Um, and I just want to take a, a minute to outline the principal aim of the review of the Mental Health Act um, is to improve the, the rights and protections of a person with a mental disorder and remove barriers uh, to uh, those caring for their health and welfare. And it will do this by reviewing the developments in mental health law and practice on compulsory detention and care, care and treatment um, since the Mental Health Act came into force. Making recommendations that gives effect to the rights, will and preferences of the individual by ensuring that mental health, incapacity and adult support and protection legislation reflects people's social, economic and cultural rights, including UN, CRPD and ECHR requirements, and considering the need for the convergence of incapacity, mental health and adult support and protection legislation. We intend to announce the chair of the review shortly and clearly it will be for them to determine how the review um, is best taken forward. I want to be clear, however, that this work will be stakeholder-driven and evidence-led. I'm determined that throughout the process, the views of service users, those with lived experience and those who care for them are at the front and centre of this work, so they can help us to shape the future direction of our legislation. Um, each stage of the process will have to create an engagement strategy showing how the review will seek to gather as wide-ranging views as possible, including those I have already mentioned, professionals, as well as people with a, a more academic interest. The third sector in particular will be key to making this happen. They have a wealth of knowledge and understanding concerning the impact of legislation on people's lives. And I very much hope that you will welcome the announcement of this review, which complements the work that is already underway and which will ensure that Scotland's mental health legislation continues to lead the way in ensuring rights and protections of our citizens. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, maybe if I can um, begin with the questioning. So in your statement on Tuesday, you announced the review of the full legislative framework that supports and protects people with a mental disorder. And this includes the Mental Health Care and Treatment Scotland Act 2003, the Adults with Incapacity Scotland Act 2000, and the Adult Support and Protection Scotland Act 2007. You also refer to reviews or other work that will be undertaken, which might improve practice without requiring legislative change. This has obviously been addressed in your letter to the committee, but I wonder for clarity, can you confirm how many separate reviews or distinct pieces of work will be taken forward as part of the overarching review? So, um, as you um, as you outlined there, there's there's already currently work ongoing which will help to um, feed into this overarching review. So, there's work ongoing in terms of um, Mental Health Act uh, uh, in uh, relation to people with learning disability and autism. Um, there's also ongoing work in terms of the Adults with Incapacity Act, and the and all, we're also anticipating uh, work in terms of the um, the uh, Adult Support and Protection legislation. So uh, a lot of uh, uh, often, as I said in my opening statement. Um, people are uh, find this quite confusing because they can find themselves being um, under several pieces of legislation at one time. We need to ensure that those work streams continue um, and that we ensure that, uh, that our work is uh, clear and concise in a very complex area. Um, but uh, under the chairmanship of the review of the Mental Health Act, they will, that work will then feed into the, the um, overall review. Um, Kirsty is probably able to tell you a bit more about the work that's already ongoing in terms of the Adults with Incapacity Act um, are, and how we um, envisage um, ensuring that that, um, that work fits in with the current work streams or that are ongoing. Yes, uh, Minister, I'm happy to... Um, speak to the committee on that. What, um, as the committee will be aware, we have been looking at the adults with incapacity legislation um, over the past year or so, and it's been quite clear that there are uh, distinct areas of crossover between the adults with incapacity and the mental health legislation, um, namely the um, way capacity is assessed and the definition of mental disorder and the use of uh, an individual's mental disorder is the gateway to intervention under both the adults with incapacity legislation and the mental health legislation. So that's an area that couldn't be looked at in isolation um, under a review solely of the adults with incapacity legislation. 
when we've been out meeting with stakeholders, there has been uh, met, there have been many, many calls for us to take a wider approach um, and to consider, as say, more holistically, uh, the crossover between mental health and incapacity law. Um, and that's what will be happening with the review that was announced on Tuesday, which has been widely welcomed by certainly all of the stakeholders that we, that we have been um, meeting with over the past year. What has also been very clear, um, as we've been meeting with stakeholders, is that whilst there are concerns around some areas of the process around adult think capacity legislation, um, there's a, um, there is there's a strong desire to ensure that in looking at the Act, we don't throw away what is very good about the legislation. Um, when the Act was first um, first came into force, it was groundbreaking, and in many areas still remains so, particularly with regard to the principles under the legislation, which are the which uh, in summary are the principles of least intervention, of ensuring that the, the wishes and preferences of the adult are taken into account. Um, and we have been told time and time again by stakeholders that if actually the practice around adult think capacity um, adhered more closely to the principles of the legislation, then we would be uh, far more close to full adhe with, to adherence with the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability that might currently be considered the case. Um, so whilst we uh, await the outcome of the review, which will obviously impact on possible legislative changes to adults with incapacity, we're going to be proceeding with a comprehensive programme of non-legislative changes to practice and guidance. In principle, among this is developing a strategy for supported decision making to enable people with impaired capacity to have the support they need to make their own decisions about life and care. That's a fundamental aspect of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, enabling people to exercise their legal capacity on an equal footing. Um, uh, and in addition to that, um, we're seeking to improve the training for professionals ac across health, social care and the law um, to ensure that those who uh, require to know about the adult incapacity legislation are fully aware of the range of options um, and the principles that they need to act in un uh, when doing so. Um, our first priority is to consider, uh, is to look at revising uh, guidance and codes of practice on powers of attorney. Um, and this work will highlight the need for every adult in Scotland to consider uh, appointing an attorney while they have capacity to do so. And it will also provide information on the rights and responsibilities of attorneys and the safeguards that are in place to protect individuals and the sanctions that can be imposed for misuse of power of attorney. If the committee requires any further information about this work, we'd be happy to write in detail to I think our, our, we have some questions around that, which I will tease some of that out, but it's helpful if you can provide further information at the end if we feel as if there's anything we've missed. It does feel very complex to me and complicated, um, and I wonder how um, you see it being coordinated and managed. So will the chair of the review manage all of this? Is there some kind of timeline that's visible so we can check, or the parliament? What's the parliamentary engagement with the process? How visible is the... I mean, I did hear the, the minister in, in the chamber on Tuesday saying you didn't want to be... Um, you didn't use this term, but I understood it, like being constrained by a fault, you know, putting a date on something which then things become too complex and you don't want to be driven by that, and I understand that completely. But how do you see... Um, it being managed so it doesn't we don't get overwhelmed by the complexity of it that it's still visible to everybody so we can understand what you're trying to do um, and what is do you envisage the parliamentary engagement so we can see as the process is going on how progress has been made uh, I absolutely I can, I can completely understand convener and um, why why you would uh, be concerned ab about the complexity of this because it is very complex and there are several work streams going on currently um, as as uh, Kirsty uh, had indicated it's it's become evident that we can't just have those work streams working in isolation that we actually need to pull all of this legislation together and have a have an overview of uh, mental health legislation um, and capacity legislation that's what's brought us 
to this point. Uh, we, we will have uh, processes in place and um, regular reporting from those work streams to ensure that they are coordinated. Um, Teresa uh, will take a, a will be able to explain exactly how, how we're going to manage that process, convener, with your indulgence. Thank you. Um, each of the work streams um, is being or will be provided, obviously, with an, an, um, a briefing on the work of the different elements so that they can fully understand what's happening, particularly important for the new chair um, person who's going to come in for the review on the mental health legislation. Um, then what we will do is, through officials, we will um, maintain oversight of where each of them, um, the reviews are, and um, provide informal um, opportunities opportunities to um, meet together and share information, um, as well as um, put in place a structure of more formal engagement for critical stages um, of each of the pathways for the reviews that are being conducted. Okay. I think we're, we're very aware that we are spinning lots of plates here, um, and so we're, we're really keen at the outset to make sure that we have structures uh, and processes in place to ensure that there is good communication and that, um, that we're, we're, not, uh, we're ensuring that everyone is, is coordinated in their work. Okay. Um, Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks. Um, Convener, good morning. Minister, good morning to your officials. Um, we, we know that the Scottish Government consulted last year on the Adults with Incapacity Scotland Act 2000 uh, in its paper proposals for reform. Uh, now, the, the paper stated that at the same time a scoping exercise was to be carried out uh, to find out what is currently happening across Scotland by way of support for decision making for those who need it in supporting persons to exercise their legal capacity and that working groups with a range of stakeholders would be set up uh, with the aim of establishing a, a strategy for support for decision making that would underpin the adults with incapacity, incapacity legislation. So um, again for, for clarity and, and further to your statement this week, can you provide any further information about the consultation and outcomes and can you confirm that this is something that will be included within uh, and help to inform the overarching review? Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr McDonald, for that question. The, the, the work that you refer to, regrettably, um, was delayed um, due to difficulties in recruiting staff to carry out that work or carry that work forward last year. We've now resolved those uh, staffing issues and um, I'm pleased to report that Scottish Government officials uh, met with People First, which is a, a learning disabled organisation, um, this week um, to uh, learn from them, um, uh, from their law and human rights group, about the, the work that they've been doing to support um, decision making. Um, we're in the early stages of planning workshops with a range of stakeholders um, to learn from them what is needed by the way of support to exercise um, legal capacity. Um, and um, following on from that, we'll, uh, we'll be looking for volunteers to support us in further developing the strategy and to test it out. Um, and I'd like to assure the committee that this work is a priority for us this year. Okay, thanks. Um, I mean, clearly, you, you stressed in, in your statement the need to uh, to engage with stakeholders, um, including many others in the, in the third sector. Okay, so it's good to, to hear that you've met with with people first. But um, how, how would how would you ensure that uh, you'll achieve that level of engagement that uh, that, that you've committed to? Um, well, it is, oh, far be it from me to, to tell a chair how to conduct a review, uh, as we're, we're, we've been um, appointing someone to do that. But I will be—I am very clear from the outset that the voices of lived experience, service users, their carers, and their families have to be front and centre of this entire review. Um, and I, I will be very clear when, when a chair is appointed that that would be my expectations and the expectations of the Scottish Government. I think we have been very clear in, in, uh, in reviews that, uh, that have been commissioned um, that we need to have the voice of lived experience at the heart of that. Teresa, did you want to come in here? Yeah. Sorry, c could I just add um, that there, there will be engagement um, and stakeholder strategies will form part of the... Um, work packages um, that the um, 
the delivery of this review will um, have in place and we will ensure that the chair is provided with appropriate support to in, um, not just inform those different engagement strategies but also to have oversight of the work going forward and through the, the um, engagement at an informal and formal level of the chairs um, we will also ensure that there's engagement at that sort of programme level um, to uh, fully understand and be able to evidence um, the appropriate evidence that's being used, um, I, whether that's academic or um, other evidence, as well as the engagement strategies that are in place um, to ensure that not just organisations but people with lived experience and carers themselves are um, engaged with as part of that um, strategy. Okay, thanks. Um, that, that's uh, encouraging to hear. Um, if I could move on um, to the um, issue of, uh, well, in, in May 2017, uh, the Mental Welfare Commission for Scotland and the Centre for Mental Health and Capacity Law uh, published the report, Scotland's Mental Health and Capacity Law, the Case for Reform. Uh, and one of the recommendations in that report was that, uh, and I quote, there should be a long-term programme of law reform covering all forms of non-consensual decision-making affecting people with mental disorders, end quote. So can you confirm that uh, this will be included within the review and how that might look? Uh, yes, I, I can certainly confirm that, that that would be an area that would be covered by the review. This might be an area that um, John Mitchell might be able to add a bit more um, information on? Yes. Um, uh, those um, sentiments uh, echo the original Millen Committee, which uh, I think foresaw the need to create what we're calling convergence in terms of these different legislations and how they protect the rights of people and the fundamental idea of um, how we protect decision making and, and uh, involve people in their, their own care. Um, so the, the most recent report talks about a, a, you know, a longer term vision, but I, I think this would be a fundamental aspect of what we would be expecting from this review. And, and as explicitly as the Minister said, the third point um, in the purpose of the review is looking at the convergence of those legislations around decision making. Okay, thank you. Minister, good morning, panel. Um, we understand that the UNCRPD um, has rights are not legally enforceable in the same way as EHR, ECHR rights are within Scotland. But this is uh, something that you have referred to uh, in, in, uh, as to providing an impetus for this increased focus. Will the review be looking at the enforceability of this range of rights within Scotland? So, as, as, I, as I said in my statement, we're taking this opportunity to, to look again at legislation to ensure that the rights and protections of those with mental disorder are fully respected, that the, the review will make recommendations that will give effect to the rights, will and preferences of individuals, making sure that mental health and incapacity and adult and support uh, legislation reflects people's social, economic, cultural rights, um, including the requirements for the UN, CRPD and ECHR. Can I ask a question further? Uh, Minister, there is an issue uh, concerning the legal standing of personal advocates to people with mental health incapacity. Is that going to be covered in the review? Well, all, all of the uh, all of the legislation of mental health and incapacity will be reviewed. Kirsty's may be able to give you a bit more information on, on, on specifically a, uh, adults with incapacity legislation and the issue that you raise. It's certainly the, the, the question of independent advocacy and its place within supported decision making um, is, is part of our development of strategy of uh, supported decision making. We're well aware of the importance and value that independence advocacy has and the the difference, the very positive difference that having an independent advocate can make to a person. Um, so yes, it is, it is part of the work that we are taking forward. Because I have one concern on that very subject, and that is the question, and drilling down on it, is the legal standing of that advocate in relation to decision making. It seems to be a big grey area at the moment. Uh, yes, I, I would agree with you. It is a grey area, and it's, a, it's one that requires clarity. So that will be um, looked at? Yes, absolutely. Good. Thank you. Thank you. And panel. Um, the pet petitioner also refers to Article 12.4 of the Convention on the Rights of a Person with Disabilities. 
He considers that the appropriate and effective safeguards to prevent abuse in accordance with international human rights law are set out in that convention are lacking in the Scottish mental health and incapacity legislation. How will this, this be factored into the overarching review? So I think it, it's worth noting, as I'd said in, in, in my opening remarks, that most people who use mental health services um, do so, they receive that treatment voluntarily. So there are very few people who actually are uh, subject to an order or certificate under the Mental Health Act. Um, but for some individuals, it, compulsory treatment is used to provide the person with the medical treatment that they need to alleviate suffering um, and for the protection of both the person and others. Um, Compulsory treatment is only allowed under mental health legislation in Scotland in very strict circumstances. There are a number of safeguards, including independent advocacy, um, an independent mental health review tribunal who grant and review orders for compulsory treatment. And there's also the independent body, the um, Mental Welfare Commission, um, that monitor the use of Scottish mental health law, including compulsory treatment. And the Commission also has the power to intervene in uh, cases if there's evidence of improper care, uh, treatment or practice. Um, under the 2003 Act, any service user has the right uh, to support from an independent advocate um, and the right to appoint a named person to represent their interests. Um, also the right to make an advance statement setting out um, how uh, and what treatment they would like and uh, would not like um, when they are unwell. The 2015 Act introduced further changes to ensure that people um, with a mental disor disorder can access uh, effective treatment quickly. Um, and it also strengthens support for um, decision making and, and promoting rights. Okay. Rachel Hamilton. Uh, thank you, convener, and welcome to the panel. Um, it's widely recognised that people living with dementia are in certain circumstances denied uh, their human rights and sometimes um, physically or chemically restrained. Um, the petitioner uh, considers that the lives of elderly people with dementia uh, will be shortened uh, in breach of the article to um, ECHR, and, and that is due to the chemical restraint. Um, but with this in mind, Will the Scottish Government intend to amend Scotland's health and social care standards? And so they would, in the petitioner's words, no longer condone the use of chemical constraint. And would this be, for example, something that could be addressed without legislative change? Um, so in, improving care and, and support for, for people with dementia um, and those who care for them is, has been a major ambition for, for this government. Um, our legislation follows a rights-based approach um, and uh, the Code of Practice which accompanies the Adult with Incapacity Act explains um, that the use of covert medication is permissible in certain limited circumstances, for example, um, to safeguard the health of an adult who is unable to consent to treatment in question, where, there, where other alternatives have been explored <coughs> um, and none are practicable. Um, I think uh, probably John Mitchell would, would be best placed to explain how that works in practice um, and some of the, the, the difficulties that, uh, that uh, families, carers and clinicians face in terms of um, providing care and treatment, appropriate care and treatment for uh, people with particularly dementia, severe dementia, who require medication but are not able to give the consent for that medication. Um, John, would you be able to? Yeah, yes, I think this is a, a you know a real concern, and, and I'm grateful um, to you to raising the raising the issue. Um, uh, there is a fundamental challenge between uh, protecting the rights of people, but also protecting them from ill health and the consequences of, of ill health. Um, the uh, the legislation is quite clear and practice is quite clear that, that nobody should be forced to have medication uh, without their consent if they have capacity. The the challenge is if they do not have capacity and the current legislation, the Adults with Incapacity Act, allows uh, treatment for physical um, uh, disorder and the Mental Health Act for mental disorder when capacity is not present. Um, the, uh, the, the all 
medications, of course, have side effects, and uh, the concerns about the use of, for example, antipsychotics in elderly people and the, uh, the increased risk of falls, uh, the effect on blood pressure is a very real risk. Um, and clinicians on a day-to-day -day basis have to uh, weigh that risk, as they do with any treatment, the, the, the side effects of it versus the benefits of it. Um, and when um, somebody with dementia, for example, is in a psychotic and distressed and agitated state, um, actually there may be more risk to their uh, health, for example, from falls, uh, for them not being treated than them being treated. That, thank you, uh, Mr Mitchell. I understand that obviously it's, it's a very important decision that the clinician must make um, in, in that intervention. Um, but the, the Petitioner particularly asks whether the um, Scotland's health and, and social care standards could be amended without going down that legislative route in order that we do not condone the use of chemical constraint. Um, well, well, the the use of chemical restraint, as the minister said, um, is authorised under certain circumstances, and and there's very clear guidance for clinicians. The Mental Welfare Commission has explicit published guidance on the use of covert medication, as do the Royal College of Nurses and Psychiatrists. Um, the, uh, the you know the, there is um, very detailed um, guidance for practitioners on considerations of consent and capacity, and on the use of covert medication already in in the uh, you know that's available in Scotland and people are aware of. Um, so I'm I'm not aware if any further amendment would be needed beyond I think the very necessary consideration of this as part of the total review. Thank you. Is there a difference between um, giving someone their medication without their consent because it's part of their medical condition or which some slightly different which is chemical constraint maybe we've heard it maybe anecdotally called the chemical caution which is just about managing people um, and I wonder is that do you think that's something the petitioner is trying to address and I wonder uh, how you would respond to that which is quite different from somebody not being able to consent to the medication they require for whatever their condition is, to somebody just managing somebody? Um, yes, there are two issue, issues that the, the petitioner has raised. There's, there's the discussion about covert medication, but uh, I think Kavina, as you quite rightly say, also um, about, um, if you like, what clinicians might call rapid tranquilisation. Um, so um, the, the situation where it is quite clear that a, a medication is being administered, but it is um, against the wishes or without the consent of the ind individual having that. And that might not be necessarily in a demented situation situation, but indeed with young, um, you know, psychotic and dangerous individuals who may have to uh, be be in hospital. Um, so the two are the two are different. Um, and uh, there are, again, uh, you know, different different guidance on principles for both of those different situations. The situation of emergency tranquilization with medicine is a very common situation um, that, that unfortunately is required in, in some circumstances. Um, and uh, again, the, the Mental Welfare Commission lays out explicit um, guidance on that, but the Act also contains in it particular safeguards um, so that, for example, if a patient is subject to compulsion, then if a uh, if, a, if medication is administered without that person's consent, which, which is a section 243 issue, then the, there is a, a legal responsibility for the clinician to document why they're doing that and, and inform the Mental Welfare Commission, who are the overarching watchdog, independent from government, uh, promoting and protecting the rights of uh, people in Scotland with mental health problems. Okay, I mean, this is maybe more a question for the Minister, but the, the petitioner is also, I think, at the heart of the petition is this concern about the human rights of the person who may be um, treated against their will. And he describes, he, he asks, um, why the Minister made no reference to the absolute right of patients not to be subjected to inhuman or degrading treatment. Um, and he references you know, the Robert Napier case against Scottish ministers. But he also talks about, you know, he asked, will the Scottish Government study the definition of inhuman and degrading treatment provided by the European Court of Human Rights in paragraph 52 of its judgment in the Pretty versus UK case and consider whether forced treatment might at times fall into the prohibited inhuman category um, as he believes that it 
did in, in an example that um, perhaps has provoked or prompted his petition. So there is something slightly different there, which is about in terms of human rights legislation, is this kind of treatment in itself inhumane or degrading and should that therefore be is that, is that being taken into account by the government? I mean, it's, it's certainly convenient. Our, our um, legislation is compliant with the European Convention on Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, and it's it's never been found in part or in whole uh, of uh, by the European Court of Human Rights to be incompatible with the convention. We uh, are obviously um, conducting or, or, or commissioning this review so that it takes account of, of developments and changes in uh, human rights legislation. Um, and so it would be looking at where what the current human rights legislation is, um, whether that be European or, or UK human rights legislation at that point in time. None of us know where we're going to be at, at that time. Um, and, but of course, we also um, a, make ensure that we are abiding by the appropriate case law that, that emanates from the European Courts of, of Human Rights. And I think the hopefully the, the petitioner can be assured that Scottish Government do indeed take cognizance of, of Article 1 of that convention, ensuring that everyone in, within its jurisdiction have the rights and freedoms um, provided by Section 1 of that convention. Specifically look at this question of whether some of the treatment that's been um, used may fall within um, the absolute right on uh, not to be subject to inhuman or degrading treatment? I, but as, I say, as I said, Convena, we certainly the legislation we have not, has not been found in part or in whole uh, of uh, being in breach. I think that specific, and I'm, I may be incorrect here, the lawyers in the room will tell me, that specific legislation related to slopping out practices in Berlin and was not... Uh, I think the point the petitioner is making is if that case can be founded on the idea of inhuman mm -hmm. degrading treatment, will the review at least consider the possibility that, in the view of the petitioner and, and, mm -hmm. and others, I'm sure, that some of the things that happen to folk um, in terms of the treatment could also fall within that category? And what reassurances can you give that you would actually be looking at that? Uh -huh. I, mean, I don't have any. I don't have a view one way or another yeah. of what that review or, or, or consideration would establish. But it's clearly an issue uh -huh. for yeah. the petitioner, and we'd want you to absolutely. Reflect I, on that. Yeah, and I, I and, and absolutely, I can understand. I have I have met the petitioner in the past and, and heard his views and and, and concerns, um, and uh, certainly I would be expecting that that the the review would be looking at all human rights legislation. But I think. My, um, Dr. Mitchell wants to come in at this point. Yep. And yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you, Mister. Um, the the uh, absolute and qualified human rights, um, you know, are, are a complex area, and I'm I'm not a lawyer, and I think the evolving story of that is why we are having this to review to some extent. But but um, Article Two, which is the right to life, is an absolute right, and uh, what that means is there's a duty not to take away anyone's life, and a duty to take reasonable steps to protect life, um, and a uh, the Article um, 14 is the right not to be discriminated against, and that uh, that could be interpreted in terms of people having the right to the same effective treatment as other people. Um, and Article 25 is the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. So I, I'm, I'm really just saying these are illustrations that show that the, the, the counterpoint between these different articles um, and how then an individual is protected while still protecting uh, their absolute rights is, you know, is a challenging one, and um, I think with the, you know the, the two decades now we've had with the current legislation and the experience of rights and consideration of that is the reason why this review is really timely for an expert consideration of these issues. Okay, you would accept this that maybe, as we've said earlier, this distinction between effective treatment for the individual and a means by which the system manages patients. Yes. And therefore, you would, when you're looking at those, you would look at them differently in terms of human rights. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Morris Corey. Thank you. Um, following on, uh, Minister and panel, from the previous question and response, will the review itself consider what advice regarding uh, informed consent of people with disabilities should be given to psychiatrists and other medical practitioners? 
Yes, so we're, we're um, developing a strategy for supported decision making to enable people with impaired capacity to have the support that they need to make their own decisions about their lives and care. Um, and we'll provide a comprehensive training programme for uh, professionals across health, social care and the law. Um, and we're improving the provision of support for guardians and attorneys um, and we're revising um, the current codes of practice and uh, guidance to provide clarity on the law as it stands. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, two last questions from me. I wonder if you've got an idea of what outcomes might come from the review, I mean, in general terms, obviously. Um, for example, do you think there's a possibility of consolidating legislation as opposed to new legislation? Um, well, I <laughs> I, I, I'm glad you caveated that, that slightly. Uh, there can be, an, um, because I don't want to preempt the, the outcomes, um, but certainly the, there is a, certainly the possibility that there could be convergence, as um, as I'd said in my statement um, in Parliament, um, that there could be convergence of, of the mental health and uh, incapacity legislation. Uh, but I, as I say, I don't want to, I don't want to prejudge what what the outcomes will be. Um, or what the work will recommend. Okay, and you know, obviously you've already um, highlighted that the announcement on the chair will be made soon. Um, a ministerial definition of soon can be sometimes quite flexible. I wonder if you you do you have um, an indicative time when that might be. Um, and also, you talked about um, the work being supported by a short life working group. I wonder, uh, have you got an anticipated lifespan for the short life working group? Uh, so, I, I appreciate I appreciate your house and soon. Um, if you if you speak with my officials, you know that soon when they speak to me is yesterday. Um, when I, when I'm asking for something, um, so yes, we, we we need to get the right person. This is a really complex review. It's a really important review. Um, and so we need to make sure that we get the right person. But uh, rest assured that, that I will be not resting on my laurels, um, and that I be, will be doing this as 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 speedily as we can in terms of appointing a, a chair. Um, in terms of the short life working group, um, we're in the, it will include representation from uh, patients, uh, service users, patients with lived, uh, persons with lived experience, relatives, the Mental Welfare Commission, um, representatives uh, of of uh, those who have a mental disorder and third sector organisations, um, Scottish Human Rights Commission, Mental Health Review Tribunal, health boards, local authorities, our principal medical officer, Scottish Prison Service, the courts um, and tribunal service. So a wide ranging, uh, uh, wide ranging uh, views and 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 people um, contributing to that. I think we're anticipating that 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 will uh, the the initial stage will be about twelve months. Um, but there is, as I say, there is all there is also work ongoing, um, and uh, we're anticipating that the um, learning disabilities and autism review of mental health uh, legislation and how that affects those populations. Um, I'm expecting uh, to uh, have uh, them bring back their recommendations by the end of this year, and so that will also feed into the work that's ongoing. Thanks. So there are lots of different work streams going on. Rachel Hamilton. Just a point of clarification, convener, um, a question to John Mitchell, if I may. Um, you made reference to the um, Article 2 of the Convention giving individuals an absolute right to life. If um, the, the review of the legislation took into account um, the, the full uh, field of human rights, um, would that then be the case that doctors could no longer prescribe um, drugs concealed in food? For example, would there be a change to the current practice? Um, I mean, I think that's a matter for the review, and it's a matter for legal interpretation, um, you know, an application of the rights. I, I think I wouldn't be able to um, anticipate the outcome of the review. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. And last question. Um, this committee has done quite a lot of work around MESH, and of course there's a whole question there about the independent review. And then there was work done by Professor Britton to look at the effectiveness of that independent review. Will you be looking at her report in terms of some guidance about the highest standards of how these reviews are operated? 
Uh, absolutely. We will be looking at the best practice for carrying out a review, as I'm sure you would expect us to do, convener. Okay, because the big issue then was the extent to which some of the stakeholders felt excluded. So, I mean, it's a huge challenge, even describing the membership of the Short Life Working Group in I, itself challenging. I, I, absolutely, but I, but I hope that the, the committee have heard, as, as I hope Parliament heard, um, and the wider community, that uh, service users um, and patients uh, or people with lived experience in their families are at the front and centre of this review. They will be at the heart of what we do. Thank you very much for that. I think that's been... Um, very useful. Of course, the committee is taking full credit for the timing of the announcement, but, um, but I'm sure the petitioner and others, and far more broadly, will welcome um, the decision by the Minister to take this forward. We have to think about what we want to do next with the petition. I think the suggestion is that we perhaps reflect on what has been said today. It affords the petitioner the opportunity also to reflect on it and anyone else. You may want to make a, um, a comment on it, and then we can perhaps come back to the committee at a later stage to see how we will actually manage the petition. It does feel to me as if the petitioner's um, request has been met, um, and I'm sure he's he's pleased with that, but we can decide that at a later stage if that's agreeable. Agreed. Okay. Agreed. Thank you very much, and thank you, Minister, for that. Can I just suspend briefly to allow a changeover of witnesses?
call the meeting back to order. Um, the next evidence session relates to the committee's inquiry into mental health support for young people in Scotland. As you know, this inquiry was launched in connection with Petition 1627, Consent for Mental Health Treatment for People Under 18 Years of Age, raised by Annette McKenzie. And um, as you'll also be aware, the committee wishes to understand where young people can seek help at an early stage um, before they reach crisis, and also, I think, to the extent to which young people are aware themselves of how they might support their peers and generally um, in increasing public awareness around that, I think, what we've already established is quite a complicated landscape. At its meeting on the 21st of February 2019, the committee considered thematic analysis from the call for evidence, and we again are very grateful to all of those who have responded. We did get um, a wide range of evidence, and th that wide range of evidence received through the inquiry, it's clear that the Scottish Government is undertaking a wide range of work in the area of children and young people's mental health services. To assist the committee in determining where it could focus its work in this inquiry, an update has been requested from the Minister for Health, Mental Health on the progress of Scottish Government policies. To this end, the Minister is here to give evidence to the committee, and she is accompanied by John Mitchell, the Senior Medical Advisor, Hugh McAloon, Deputy Director, Children and Young People's Mental Health, Philip Raines, Head of the Children and Young People's Mental Health Delivery Unit, and Lindsay Wilson, Senior Policy Lead, Suicide Prevention, the Scottish Government. So can I again welcome the Minister and the officials to the meeting, and can I invite you, Minister, to provide a brief opening statement of up to no more than five minutes, after which we'll move to questions. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. I'm happy to set out the Scottish Government's approach to improving the support for our nation's mental health and address any issues that you may raise. Uh, let me start by describing our vision and how that shaped the work we've set out. My vision for children and young people's mental health is that presented in the 2017 Mental Health Strategy, that children and young people can get the right help at the right time, expect recovery and fully enjoy their rights free from discrimination and stigma. We know that in order to achieve this, a uh, decisive change is needed in the way that children and young people are supported. The Audit Scotland report on children and young people's mental health highlighted that there is often too great a focus on crisis and specialist services at the expense of early intervention and prevention. You will have seen the recent report from the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee on that Audit Scotland report. And we welcome that report and its recommendations, just as we did the report by Audit Scotland. This is why we are taking action in several areas. First, we acknowledge that performance in specialist services needs to improve. Recent statistics show that improvement is happening. However, I am clear that we need to remain focused on driving sustainable and faster improvement. Steps are being taken to drive that change. We have invested £4 million in improving the capacity of CAMS with the recruitment of 80 additional staff. Discussions are underway to support performance as part of the development of the annual operating plans of NHS boards. We are increasing resources uh, to support improvement in health services in every part of Scotland. And lastly, I have established a new strategic board for mental health, which I chair, to monitor and drive the necessary improvements. Secondly, sustainable performance will only be possible if we drive wider system change. Our 2017 mental health strategy set out the key framework for achieving this, and this has been backed by ambitious commitments to action and resources in the programmes for government for uh, 2017 and 2018. And we are committing a quarter of a billion pounds to this work. We set out our detailed plans in Better Mental Health in Scotland, which we published last December. Key to this is not simply improving the capacity of our health services, but all services that can support mental health. And this is why we're making significant investments in the capacity of education to support children and young people. And thirdly, we are looking to key independent groups to highlight where reform needs to go in future. For the issues today, the work of the Children and Young People's Mental Health Task Force under the chair of Dr Dame Denise Coya will be vital. The task force will set out detailed recommendations to the Scottish Government and COSLA this spring, and these recommendations will drive our future work. Similarly, the National Leadership Group for Suicide Prevention under the chair of Rose Fitzpatrick will make recommendations on how we can more effectively make suicide everybody's business. 
Both these groups set out their delivery plans last December. At the same time, we are undertaking major reviews of key issues within mental health. In the past month, we have announced a major review of forensic mental health services, as well as a wider ranging review of the Mental Health Act. And lastly, I want to highlight the critical importance of reducing the stigma around mental health and ensuring that young people are comfortable about speaking out if they experience poor mental health. Mental health is one of our key public health priorities and we will work with the new Public Health Scotland body and other partners on how to drive this priority across all our work. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much for that. I think one of the things we are interested in is focusing on the kind of early interventions around a young person's life and the kind of support that they can um, draw on. And in the Scottish Government's 2018-19 programme for government, I think there were a number of announcements that were made in relation to mental health service with that kind of perspective. I wonder if you can give the committee an update on the progress of the goal to have counselling services in every secondary school, the additional 250 school nurses, and the training for teachers in mental health first aid to be offered in every local authority. And perhaps can I also ask, I know this wasn't a commitment, but the idea of mental health first aid training, not just for teaching staff, but for other staff within a school, is that something that you would consider? Um, can I, if, if, uh, if the convener allows, can I take those points individually? Yeah. So um, in terms of uh, counselling services um, in every secondary school, we set out our commitment to ensure that every secondary school would have access to counselling services, as you see in the 2018 programme for government. Um, the work in introducing counselling in schools is progressing well. Um, we are continuing to work in partnership with COSLA um, to, deliver a, uh, to establish a delivery model for the commitment. And my officials have been working very closely, as you would expect, with uh, officials in uh, education uh, portfolio. Um, officials continue to work in partnership with COSLA and local authorities to establish um, a formal joint agreement and they've completed two of the four stages required for this. Uh, further work has been undertaken to establish the appropriate funding model for the distribution of resource to education authorities um, and it's anticipated that that will be considered by COSLA in April. I think it, it's also key here to, uh, to highlight and something that perhaps ha it hasn't been highlighted um, that the, the counselling service service that we are putting into um, secondary schools is a year-round service. This is not a term time, um, uh, because we need to recognise that, that young people, the, their needs don't stop when the school, school closes for, for, uh, for recess. Um, in terms of the additional school nurses, um, we set out a commitment for an additional 250 school nurses in the 2018 programme for government. Um, as a first step uh, in rolling out that commitment, um, a survey of the existing school nursing capacity in every NHS board has been completed and that will inform the development of an action plan for rolling out the additional capacity um, and the necessary upskilling um, of the existing workforce, um, which is due in late spring, and the relevant training um, coursework materials um, have now been developed to ensure that the existing workforce now have the necessary skills to be carrying out a, an extended um, role or, or a differing role. Uh, with regards to uh, training teachers uh, in, in mental health uh, first aid, um, the current programme of mental health first aid has been offered to six local authorities um, who are undertaking the training for staff who work with children and young people and we're on track to ensuring that the offer um, has been made to all local authorities within the original timescales that we had outlined. Um, we have also con uh, convened a joint project to design and develop a specific uh, training course that will be made available to all school staff. So I hope that answers your, your last question, convener. Okay, um, that all sounds interesting, but it's all process. It's all about setting up what's the funding model going to be, how are we going to get an agreement, when can we reasonably expect um, a, a school to have one of these counsellors, and when can we expect all schools to have one? Uh, we, I, I think actually I, I um, answered a question similar uh, to that in, in chamber um, not so long ago. So we have committed that uh, we will have our first tranche of count school counsellors in schools at the start of academic year 2019-2020. What proportion is our tranche? Uh, we anticipate 50%. 50%, okay, thank you very much. So I, 
appreciate what, what you were saying about a lot of that was processed, but we obviously need to ensure that the mechanisms are there to deliver those um, interventions on the ground. Yeah, I just think sometimes yeah. systems create a busyness which don't actually have outcomes to them, but if you were Absolutely. asking for things to happen yesterday, that's maybe <laughs> um, going to move the thing along a little, but I think we would want to be seeing... Not, I think people can take comfort in process, and yeah. in fact, I think what people want to see is, as a consequence of the policy, there are actually there is a difference on the ground in our schools. Absolutely, I I, I wouldn't disagree with that. Action is um, is absolutely what what we need to see, and I, and I, I hope that will be demonstrated. Okay, thank you, um, Angus Macdonald. Okay, thanks, um, convener. Um, you, you'll be aware, Minister, that the convener of uh, the Public Audit Committee stated last week that. And I quote, the, the absence of basic data in relation to a whole range of factors in mental health provision for children means that it's not possible to say whether public spending is making a difference to young people's mental health, end quote. So given the additional funding commitments being made by the Scottish Government for, for example, the £60 million investment in uh, the school counselling service, um, how are the impacts of this and similar investments to be measured in the absence of, of basic data relating to young people's mental health services? Um, so the, the Children and Young People's Task Force um, has a dedicated work stream to addressing finance issues um, and data, so it might be um, helpful at this point to ask Hugh McElwain to, to give you some details about how the Children and Young People's Task Force are, are carrying out that work. Hi. Oh, sorry. Um, and it's... Um, um, delivery plan which we published in December, the task force laid out how it's specifically going to take forward its work on finance. So I think it's seen as a very complex area. We're looking across a whole range of different services and different players. But I think what the task force did was actually take it down into some three fairly simple tasks. Um, so really that is identifying the full investment in children and young people's mental health. It's something that's come up before, that that's, a, that's something that's difficult to measure. Um, moving beyond the health service into universal children's and families services, including schools. Um, but they've set themselves a the task of doing that. Um, ensuring that that investment lands where it's intended. So when money is um, invested in um, children and young people's mental health, making sure that we have got a way of um, tracking that and making sure that it actually lands where it's meant to land. And then thirdly, the most probably important part is developing a consistent and agreed approach to ensuring that investment delivers for children and young people and their families and for the taxpayer and gives that return on that investment. So that's quite a kind of simple um, way of describing the work of that work stream. I think it's helpful that it's so simple because it really cuts to the core questions. Um, linking across into the data work stream, um, I think there's significant elements and interdependencies between the finance work stream and the data work stream. So um, all of those questions can only really be answered by an improvement in the quality of data across the entire system. Um, and I think as an area that I'm reasonably new to, um, this is one where there is no shortage of data, but information seems to be something that's hard to pull out of a lot of that data. And I think there's gaps in the data. So they're looking very much at um, the bits beyond the NHS, where there is a lot of information on what uh, data on what's going on, but it doesn't tell the full story because it doesn't reach back into universal services. So I think the interaction between the data work stream and the um, the finance work stream of the task force is going to be really important. Um, I would anticipate that a lot of that work will be informed by the other work streams. So the work stream that's looking at universal generic services within communities um, is going to be looking at an approach which brings together health and other integrated children's and family services in a way that probably hasn't been done before. Um, so really um, the, the data requirements to monitor that and monitor the effectiveness of that will probably emerge as the recommendations from that work stream emerge. Similarly, um, the the work going on in the specialist work stream, which is looking at a new and reformed approach to CAMS, um, will throw up um, questions about how you measure progress and effectiveness of that different approach. So um, the whole thing kind of fits together. Um, 
but I think the, the, the three key questions about identifying the, the level of investment, making sure it lands where it's meant to land, and um, developing a consistent approach to the return on that investment is something that runs right through the task force work. And we anticipate that the recommendations we'll get in that will actually provide clear direction on how we take that work forward. OK, sounds like quite a task. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll clearly monitor it uh, as, as it progresses. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Maurice Corey. Thank you, Governor. Um, uh, Minister and panel, um, the, uh, uh, not, um, the Audit Scotland report published in September 2018 concerning mental health services for children and young people highlighted that mental health referrals for children and young people increased by 22% over the five years from 2017 to 2018. And I think it was a very important statement, Minister, you made just now about making uh, suicide prevention, for example, everybody's business. What are the factors that have driven such a significant increase in referrals? So I, I think as, um, as a, a Dame Coyer, Dame Denise Coyer, had already noted in her initial recommendations that were published last September, and which led on to the, the formation of the, the task group, that the rise in, in referral signals a, an increased demand in services by those with um, emotional distress. Um, the rise in demand partly reflects the success of, of campaigns um, and awareness of, of mental well-being, and I think um, it's important that uh, we recognise that as a society we've be, we are much more willing to admit that we were perhaps not feeling well, that we are in distress, um, and that we're um, seeking help. But it, it may also reflect some of the increasing pressures that we hear about um, from young people. And I hear this when I when I go into schools and I talk to young people, talk to my own family, and not least of which um, seem to arise from um, social media and the, and the pressures that that, that are, are putting on to um, that particular generation. And I think those are those are pressures that our generations really don't appreciate. Um, we grew up in a very different world, um, so. Mitigating those issues is, is a fundamental rationale for the programme for government investment in, in the work of the task force um, and um, in the drive to increase the range of, of early intervention and prevention services um, that, need to, that we need to ensure are there to help children and young people. Um, some of the work that we've spoken about in terms of uh, ensuring our school teachers have mental health first aid training and have adequate skills there. Um, the increased number of school nurses that we're putting in with a focus on um, mental health and well-being, the introduction of school counsellors in every secondary school and the work that the, the task force is doing in terms of um, looking at early intervention and community well-being and, and so on are all really important in terms of getting that early intervention in there. Can I ask supplementary to this? Very good. Um, we, we talk about young people here, okay? Well, young people are, are looked after, obviously, by their parents, hopefully. Um, what are you doing within your review in connection with parent, parental guidance uh, on this issue? Because, you know, sadly, it's missing at the moment, and we've got a lot of peer pressure from uh, children getting younger and younger, you know, whether it be mobile phone use or whatever it might be in social media. I don't see anything about the parents and how you might help them so, so to educate them. You, you, you may already be aware that the chief medical officers, uh, the four chief medical officers around the UK, um, issued guidance uh, last month in terms of uh, giving guidance to parents uh, in terms of screen time and, the, uh, and social media. Uh, much of that guidance was was also about modelling good behaviour. So um, things like not using um, mobile phones at, at the the dinner table, um, keeping screens screen time out of the bedroom, the importance of sleep, and so on. Uh, John might be able to add a little bit more um, to the specifics of the guidance that the CMOs put out. Yes. Um, so, uh, as the Minister said, there's it's a specific guidance about, about social media. I, mean, I think the other aspects of our interventions with parents are at, at very early ages in terms of uh, the Psychology Positive Parenting programmes. And um, I think in, in relation to um, the emerging concern about distress in young people, and I think the true finding that uh, something for is happening with our adolescent uh, female population is uh, something new about their presentations and expressions of distress. Um, we are expanding the Distress Brief Intervention Programme from the summer of um, 
2020 to include um, people under the age of 18. And already in the, the, uh, the thinking about what that will be, it will be uh, in terms of um, work with families, not just with an individual young person on their own. It's good to hear that. Would it be helpful for you to hear about how we're involving parents in the task force? Yes, please. Yeah. So, um, Joanna Murphy, who is the chair, I believe, of the National Parents Forum for Scotland's member of the task force. Um, with Joanna's input, the task force is establishing a parents network which reaches out to parents groups across Scotland. That's at early stages, but that will be something that the task force will use to inform the development of its recommendations. So, young people at the centre of the task force, uh, Denise talks a lot about that, but... Um, also parents as well. We're also looking at um, the potential for the development of some form of digital platform which provides advice and support for um, young people and children but also for their parents and I think that's key. What we're, look, what we're expecting, what we're looking at within the task force um, is um, how that fits in with other things that are out there. So if there are actually other services out there that parents use is there something we can do to integrate whatever advice and support we could provide on mental health into that? Um, and then finally, um, Denise's work and the task force's work on um, community hub-based approaches to earlier intervention and support around mental health, very much at the forefront of Denise's mind that we um, look at support for parents. She spoke to a lot of parents, particularly of children who were rejected for CAMS, and the constant thing from parents is we need someone to talk to to help us through this. So it's very much at the heart of what I would expect to come out with a range of recommendations from Task Force. I think we're on the right track if that's the case, and I'm glad to hear it because that's music to my ears as a parent. Um, it's something I've seen a lot of. Thank you. Of course, we are mindful that the petition was prompted by Annette Mackenzie losing her daughter and not being aware that her daughter had medication. And, of course, that whole question about when is it confidential, but when is it wise to ask somebody to share what they're doing with the people around about them? Um, and, you know, very conscious of just how difficult that has been for the family. Can I um, ask David Torrance to come in here because there's some questions on... Denise Coya, and then we'll, I think we'll be going back to this question of social media. Thank you, Convener. According to the Chair of the Children and Young People's uh, Mental Health Task Force, Dr Dame Denise Coya, the following changes are required to reform and improve the system of children and young people's mental health services. A stronger focus on prevention, social support and early intervention, a wider range of more generic, less specialist in interventions to free up specialist services to see those in most need, and a better information and understanding for the public and all agencies and services of where emotional distress and mental health and mental well-being problems are best supported. Do you agree with this assessment? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, those are the themes that are, that are underpinning the work that the task force is doing. They're what um, uh, Dame Denise set out in her initial recommendations um, and uh, they're what have informed her um, commitments in the programme for government. Thank you. Um, what current mental health policy initiatives address Dr Coy's recommendation reforms and what more needs to be done to do so? So in, in terms of the, the work that's already ongoing, um, the, uh, as, as we've already spoken about, so our commitment to school counsellors um, and putting a school counsellor in every secondary school in Scotland and um, the additional support that we're providing in terms of additional school nurses, the training um, that's being offered to each local authority for all teachers to receive mental health first aid training. And I, I don't think we should, we can't look at schools in isolation. Um, we don't train someone in first aid and expect that they are only going to use those skills within perhaps the work environment or when they're volunteering, um, but that will equip a whole population of people with skills that they're able then to, to use in their everyday lives as well. Um, so I, I think there are there are a broad range of policies that um, and uh, commitments ongoing that I think will help 
improve the, the, the knowledge and the skills people have in terms of dealing with mental wellbeing and mental distress, but also help to raise the awareness of those issues throughout the, the population. I don't know if, if you want to come in here with specific things from the task force. Yeah. yeah, I mean, maybe just describing a little bit of the process of the task force is maybe helpful. So um, we've got a team within our division that's exclusively providing support to the task force, but the task force is independent of government and we're well used to doing that sort of thing. I've been involved in this sort of thing before around youth employment um, and it was more traditional in that the independent group would go off, come up with recommendations and the government and COSLA would consider them and implement them as a whole. This time round it feels a bit more interactive, which I think is important because you know we are um, looking at um, a set of issues out there which are live right now for children, young people and their families. So. In some ways, it's similar in that there will be independent recommendations coming to the government and COSLA for consideration and, if agreed, subsequent implementation. However, rather than wait until the end of the task force in 2020, we're anticipating the task force will just, at various intervals, provide um, recommendations for consideration as it goes through its work. So rather than wait until everything's ready, um, if there are areas they want to make recommendations that are ready to go, then they, those will come in. Um, I think we probably all agree on what needs to change. I think Denise describes that really well and why. So a wider range and easier to access approach that's built on prevention and early intervention um, that, that largely um, is underdeveloped at the moment and why that needs to happen. The you know, waiting times are too high, the level of rejected referrals is, um, which shouldn't be a, a, a feature of the system at all, but it's far too high, and the distress and anguish for children, young people and their parents that goes with that. That's why we're doing it. I think the task force's role is not about um, endlessly describing that, but is actually about, talk about how we change that. And I would expect the task force's recommendations to be challenging, um, because you'd be kind of surprised if they weren't challenging. We know that um, the status quo needs to be challenged. So um, as we go, I would hope that what we'd be able to do is work with our colleagues in local government to take forward some of the recommendations, even as the task force is continuing with its work. Um, so that's something of a feature that I would anticipate seeing over the next, um, the next year and a half. Thank you. Hamilton. Thank you, convener. Uh, we talked earlier about um, the social media, and it's an important strand of this committee's work in our inquiry into mental health. And uh, Mr. Mitchell mentioned uh, the chief medical officer, Catherine Caldwood, saying she did say that there's no evidence of causation of harm, uh, but she stated that there has been a rise in children's depression. And she also says that the quality of life Children say that the quality of their life is lower if they have long periods of time uh, on their screens. And we welcome uh, you know, your announcement recently uh, on your new guidance uh, on the healthy use of social media and screen time. Um, a couple of questions specifically about that. Um, what work is currently being done to undertake the development of that guidance? And secondly, um, have the Scottish Government done any uh, work on the impact that social media is having on the well-being of young people. Thank you very much. And um, I, I think Rachel Hamilton would agree that we grew up in very different worlds to, to the ones that our children are growing up in. And, and sometimes as parents, it's quite difficult to understand the pressures that, that young people are under. Um, the, the work that you refer to, uh, we are um, in terms of um, the Scottish Government commissioned work. So we are... Um, developing advice on social media use and um, that will be produced by young people for young people and I think that's really important in terms of, of um, understanding the, the landscape and the, the world that they live in but also the credibility of that advice um, and that's currently being commissioned um, and I'm sure that we would be happy to inform the, the committee of um, further timelines um, as, as, as we have those if the committee would be interested in that. In terms of research, yes, uh, there, there was a research commissioned last year and uh, we will be publishing that research very soon. Okay. Um, I just wondered also whether you'd had um, any 
uh, collaboration or any discussions with um, social media platforms such as Facebook or Instagram, as, as in the Scottish Government, because there are recommendations that, of course, um, age verification could be improved, um, the sharing of data uh, could be useful with regards to the research um, that you have undertaken. I presume that is part, part of that as well. And industry does have a duty of care too. Um, so there was a suggestion that there was a voluntary code of conduct developed as well. I presume, Minister, that these will be some of the uh, points that come out of the, the, the work that's been going on uh, very much with the young people getting involved as well. Um, it sounds very much like that would be some of the things that would be getting done in terms of background preparation for the for the commissioning. I don't have that detail to hand about what what the exact detail of that is, um, but again, I'm happy to write to the committee to fill uh, to provide them with that information, um, if that would be something that they would be interested in. Thank in you, reading about. Minister. I might add, much of this starts to move into the territory of what is um, UK government. So we would have to work very closely because clearly there's a lot of work that UK government uh, colleagues are doing in that area and there's many of those discussions already ongoing. So it's, it, it's a question of, I think, pooling our efforts to make sure that there's a collective effort across all the nations uh, in having those discussions with the relevant platform providers or whoever to be able to do that. And there's, um, it's a question, I guess, of where we best lend our efforts to support that work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> a number of the submissions received by the committee as part of the inquiry into mental health support for young people in Scotland um, referred to a need for a change to the approach um, of mental health services. And that was a change from a biomedical model based on medicating children and young people to an approach based <coughs> upon levels of psychological distress, trauma, uh, and recognising social, psychological and, and biological factors. That kind of thing about... There's something wrong with them. Can you you fix it? Kind of view of of mental health. I think that, that people are advocating something different that from that. And I wonder, do you agree that such a change of approach would be helpful? And what policy initiatives are planned or are currently underway that would encourage this change? Because it's a kind of a mindset thing as well, isn't it? So I think we, we need to recognise that that young people's mental health extends across a spectrum from from well-being. Um, to mental illness, just like it does for, for, for all of us, um, and that a whole system approach to change and improvement is the intention of the task force, as we've heard right across that from wellbeing right through to, to treatment for illness. I think it, it, we would challenge the idea that there is a single biomedical model. Um, for the few children with mental illness uh, that, that they, they must ac be able to access evidence-based treatment and that must include um, medications. Um, we wouldn't question the need for some children to receive medication for a physical illness. So I think we have to be very careful about how, how we approach this. Um, but I absolutely recognise that people um, have concerns about use in, of medication in children. Um, um, the 2017 UK NICE guidelines on treating depression in children and young people, it quite clearly states um, that antidepressant medication should not be used for the initial treatment of children and young people with mild depression. And it provides information on, on the use of that particular medication in more severe um, conditions. Um, and that would be the prescribing guidance that we would expect clinicians to, to follow. Um, John Mitchell might be able to give you a bit more information round about the uh, safeguards that there are in terms of, of and guidelines round about the use of medication, because I think it, this is a really important issue. It's, a, it's an issue that like it's raised when, we, when the, um, the number of children prescribed medication is, is published each year, and I, I absolutely understand why that can cause some people alarm, but the vast, vast majority of children would have a psychosocial intervention or therapy, a talking-based therapy, a play-based therapy to treat their, their illness or their condition. Can I ask if that's been monitored? Because one of the questions at the core of this petition, obviously, is this question of at what point um, someone is prescribed medication and to what extent GPs and others are under pressure and therefore it shouldn't be the first protocol, but there are pressures on... I mean, I don't know, I'm not saying this is a, a universal experience. I'm wondering if there's been some work done in that, that, that where the straightforward um, option is prescription, when in fact the, the guidelines themselves say 
that should be further along the line before that happens. Yep, uh, there has been a lot of work done um, over over recent years, and John will be able to to provide the committee with the detail. I, I I think you know thanks to the energies of the petitioner, and I think it's a very important issue that the committee will be aware. I wrote out to all of the GPs in Scotland and to the Royal Colleges um, a very detailed letter. I think you know explaining the issues in the petition and the importance of awareness of guidelines and and following those guidelines as well as issues to do with consent and capacity. Um, as part of the work in the task force, in terms of the specialist um, subgroup in the task force, uh, we, we've had conversations with the Royal College of General Practitioners um, and uh, about uh, the prescribing of medication um, with GPs. And, and that conversation is ongoing at the moment to look at if there is perhaps an opportunity through the um, emerging single nationally Sc Scottish formulary for, for medicines to act actually lay out uh, if there are shared care arrangements or what exactly, who should be prescribing what, when. So those conversations are happening at the moment. Um, as the Minister says, we have a, an annual publication um, that gives us uh, data on the prescribing of medication for mental health problems in people, including in children, and that's broken down um, into, uh, into health boards. There is also primary care data that's produced for discussion at practice level about prescribing, not just about mental health medication, but about other medications. So is this question of, is this the first port of call or further along the line, is that monitored? Would you be able to identify simply, because there may, there may be circumstances, I'm not a clinician, um, where a GP feels it's the most appropriate um, decision at the first stage, but is that monitored? Well, well, the, 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 as the Minister said, the NICE guidelines are very clear that antidepressant medication should not be used for the initial treatment of children and young people with mild depression. As the NICE guidelines say that, but yes. we know that it's happened, so is it monitored? Uh, well, we, we monitor the use of antidepressant prescribing in children. So that monitoring establish at what point in the, in the journey of the child it was um, prescribed? It, it not at that that detail, no, but we would expect prescribing of antidepressants to be supervised by specialists in specialist uh, child and adolescent mental health services. And part of, as I say, the work that, that the specialist so, sorry, group... Does that mean that you wouldn't expect a G GP to prescribe antidepressants An antidepressant all, for a person? child, no. Not at all? No. The, the, the initiation of prescribing, well, we would expect that to be a specialist function. The ongoing prescribing, the, 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 the provision of a prescription would be something that uh, GPs would be asked to do. And that's why there's conversation with the Royal College of General Practice at the moment about um, you know, the precise arrangements for that. So it's specifically though on antidepressants as opposed to other related medications that might be around somebody experiencing anxiety? Um, well, I, th I think, um, you know, as, as in hap happened with the tragic case that the petitioner um, has come to us with, it wasn't an antidepressant that was the medicine that was used. But it was a medicine prescribed for anxiety. It, it was, yes, with a, with a primary function uh, for another purpose. Um, and the information on prescribing in primary care, as I say, is, is generic information, but, it's, but there is not a specific, um, you know, uh, measurement for children and young people of exactly what's prescribed, you know, for uh, for those conditions. So does that mean you wouldn't know if this were something that wasn't that was that was prevalent in the system that young people were? I'm not saying they they are, but they're routinely prescribed antidepressants at first appointment. You wouldn't know that. Uh, well, they wouldn't be prescribed an antidepressant at first appointment in going to the GP because the, the NICE guidelines are clear that we wouldn't prescribe that. And if a, a, a child was presenting a young person with moderate or severe depression, there would be an expectation that that GP would seek specialist help, specialist uh, involvement. And if there was any prescribing, it would be initiated through that process. Okay. But, and, but the system still wouldn't identify prescription for anxiety, which wasn't an antidepressant, but be something... N not across the total range of, of medicines, just in the same way for physical health conditions. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we have concluded our question, unless anybody has any further questions. Yes. Rachel? Just on that point, the, the pathway, um, is that uh, 
is that data collected? The pathway of, of say, we were, we're talking about here the GP um, prescribing um, tablets for, for anxiety. Is the pathway that the previous, say, recommendation that that young person went to um, a therapy, a different therapy, is, is that uh, data collected so that there is a, a distinct correlation between what pathway is working and what pathway isn't working before, of course, they referred to a, a specialist? I mean, we would expect that the young person in distress, um, that if they presented to their GP, if they presented to a health service, then the GP would, um, you know, use their clinical skills to assess and look at, you know, in the first order of business would be looking at uh, support and social prescribing opportunities. That information would be documented in the primary care uh, records, but, there, but there, is, there is not a national amalgamation of that information as such. I think that that would be a useful way of taking forward. So, I mean, in extreme cases where, um, you know, suicide happens, if yeah. there is a distinct pattern happening within that pathway of recommendation from a GP. Um, well, certainly when a, a very serious incident happens, like a suicide, then um, critical incident processes will mean there will be an, a, a detailed exploration of the previous historical narrative of what's happened with that person, which will le lead to recommendations. So we, we have a lot of information um, on, uh, you know, on, on suicides and, and, and the, the prodromes to suicide, suicides. The challenge is more in the generality of ordinary practice. When we recognise that present, presentations of distress are really relatively common, um, and uh, uh, not just to primary care, but to schools and to uh, you know other other services, employers and, and other things. And um, the actual um, uh, hard data on exactly that story is, 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 isn't present and it's not really possible to um, to pull it together. We are working, as I say, with the Royal College of GPs about the issue of prescribing to try and get a better handle on that information. But I think the I think the, the I think the comfort that there has been a narrative with a young person in distress that has explored um, you know the, the the supports, environmental supports available to someone um, uh, isn't necessarily as as clearly um, documented and measured, just in the same way that, for example, um, you know, middle-aged men with high blood pressure who, you know, have an earlier narrative of not necessarily about the medicines, but about, you know, uh, sports memberships and advice about their weight and about smoking, um, that that isn't necessarily measured to the same degree as, for example, we know about anti-hypertensive anti prescribing in Scotland. Okay. I'm wondering... Do you think that that um, kind of process, which says somebody who may be prescribed antidepressants has to be done by a specialist, should that apply to other forms of medication that are being given to address forms of mental health, like um, you know um, something for anxiety, which wasn't an antidepressant? Should should we, is that something that you would be looking at? Um, I think uh, there are uh, we, we we have to allow clinical judgment. We have to allow um, you know fundamental clinical decisions to be made. There are a wide range of different medical treatments used. Some of those are reserved for specialists, and some of those aren't. And it's fundamentally up to the clinician who is assessing a situation and then initiating prescribing if 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 that is of medicine. Um, I think it would be uh, I I think to to say that all prescribing of everything under any circumstances for mental health problems should only be done by specialists, I think um, would not be possible because I don't think that's possible in, in physical health. Uh, and we also have to remember that prescribing is not necessarily done by doctors. Um, so there, you know, the, it has to be proportionate. I think we have to accept that um, GPs may choose um, for example, with somebody who's saying I'm anxious and actually the problem I have is that my heart's beating so fast that it, that it is troubling me to think about using a medicine that would maintain their heartbeat at a regular, a regular level rather than you know, going to an antidepressant or to a, a sedative medicine. And I think um, you know, to, to bring in, um, uh, limit the, the, the 
the ability to prescribe the, the broad rate, broadest range of medicines for clinicians, I think I think would be would be impossible. Mm -hmm. Although I suppose the question is whether physical distress is a consequence of emotional distress, but that's maybe something that a clinician um, would be able to identify and perhaps apply the same kind of caveats or precautions that there are in relation to the prescribing of other medicine, which is really at the, at the heart of a lot of what has brought this petition in front of us. Can I um, thank you all very much? I think that has given us a lot of information around how we would want to take the inquiry forward. We're obviously going to reflect on that. The number of times the Minister made um, the offer of providing more information, I think any information that you think that would be useful to us, we would certainly um, welcome that. And I think maybe some of the issues around um, Dame Coyer's um, work is something that we might want to look at further. Um, I think we will have an opportunity to reflect on what we've heard. Um, I don't know if there are any specific points that people want to make at this stage. No. I mean, it, this is you know, not something that we're um, undertaken lightly and we recognise that it's something that we would um, what we want to try and think about in the next stages what aspects of this do we focus on in order to um, assist in and strengthen the work that's been done elsewhere and very conscious of the work that Dame Koya is doing and how substantial that is so I think possibly at a later stage we will Sorry, we will have the opportunity to reflect on that. I just wanted to make a point that um, Hugh had uh, talked about a digital platform. I think getting a bit more information about that might um, help with our inquiry too, if that's possible. We, we can provide that separately, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Not, not today. Mm -hmm. you, you, I'm not saying you've outstayed your welcome, but you've, <laughs> you have certainly provided us with a very substantial amount of your time, and we appreciate that, um, and certainly given us plenty of food for thought. And as I said, this is a... Um, we're conscious of the need to, to try and um, do work that bolsters and, 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 and assists in, in what is a very challenging area. So we will get an opportunity to reflect further on how we take the inquiry forward. But for now, can I thank you all very much for your uh, attendance? And I'm going to suspend briefly um, to allow witnesses to, to leave.
Okay, if I can call the meeting back to order. Our final petition for consideration this morning is Petition 1626 on the Regulation of Bus Services, lodged by Pat Rafferty on behalf of Unite Scotland. At our previous consideration of this petition in April 2018, we agreed to write to the Scottish Government asking it to respond to questions raised by the petitioner. As the clerk's note sets out, the Government responded to the effect that it would be bringing forward the Transport Scotland Bill in due course and the petitioners would be able to participate as part of that process. The bill has been considered at stage one by the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, which has recently published its report on the bill and has identified some concerns and provided some recommendations for the government to consider in advance of stage two of the bill. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. And we have not had a further response from the petitioner. Angus? Okay, thanks, Convener. Well, I think it's unfortunate we haven't had a response from the, pet the petitioner, given the importance of the, the petition. But uh, uh, and you know, with that fact, I think um, it would be um, I'd be loath to to close the petition, uh, to be honest, uh, given uh, its importance and given that we have the transport bill going through a uh, committee at the moment. So um, I would suggest that we should refer the petition to the REC committee for consideration uh, as, as they go through stage two, um, rather than, you know, close it. Okay, any other views? Does that give the, thank you, Convener. Does that give the petitioner the opportunity then to uh, put a further response in to the REC committee at that stage when it is passed over? In terms of stage two, it would be individual members that would be bringing forward amendments. It would allow that it would afford the petitioner the opportunity to make the case to the committee, you know, in writing or um, lobbying in terms of specific amendments, but also an opportunity for individual members of that committee to reflect on what the petition says and decide whether they want to um, bring forward a petition. Or not. My understanding would be if we refer it, it would not come back to us. That would be. They would refer. It'd be referred to them. They would deal with it, and that would. But I mean, I'm very conscious. I think the issues um, highlighted in the petition are ones that are of interest to people. You know, obviously within United Scotland. But if you remember, at the time, there are a number of other campaigns, including um, the People's Bus Pan campaign by the Cooperative Party, and I know that across party, people are um, have highlighted issues around bus services, the frequency, the reliability, and their cost. Um, so I think it is something that, that is of interest across the Parliament. I don't think it's something that would be lost in the process or in the system if it was referred to um, the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, and certainly because um, so many of these issues will be getting addressed at stage two. I don't know, Angus, you're on the committee. No, no. You're not, I keep thinking you're on the committee. You should be on it. I should, yes. In, our, in order to assist our deliberations. I do think it's Incredibly important, um, the, the situation with bus transport and the squeezing on local um, authority budgets, the subsidisation of transport, and in particular in rural areas. And I think this committee, the Rural Committee, would be the best um, committee to, to, to look at that as well, considering uh, the nature of the, the geographical locations. I think my understanding is that the, 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 the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee are addressing a lot of these issues. They have looked at this in the stage one report, and I think there are some recommendations on um, that as well. And yes, it's a rural issue, but I would also argue that it um, is an urban issue, particularly in areas, say for example, Moon City, where the key commuter routes are sustained, but actually the routes within communities can be very, can stop at six o'clock at night. You know, in, in, in Glasgow, there are places where it's not possible to get a bus after six o'clock at night, in part because the way um, some of the funding operates <clears throat> and simple, you know, it's not possible um, to uh, run the number of subsidised routes that you could argue for. Um, and there's a question there about the industry itself and how we regulate it. I think my sense is these issues will be getting addressed in committee. Um, and in referring the petition, we're perhaps flagging up to them some of the issues, which I don't think the committee itself has taken on board um, round, um, or the Scottish Government hasn't taken board round the level of regulation, the level of powers that be given to 
local authorities and actually the resource at local authorities would be able to take on that role as well. So my sense is that we do we don't want to close the petition. We recognise the importance of the issues, but we feel that it would be um, useful to refer it to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Yeah, I agree entirely with that, Chair. And I also think I think your point about urban, absolutely right, because I've seen that in my area as well, is the, the little routes being lost, uh, which are key to older people. Um, I had one case in Rolston near Paisley, exactly that. Um, so maybe that could be flagged up to the Rural Economy Committee uh, um, and the Connectivity Committee, because that's something I think is very important, because that might get lost. Mm, we would, we would in, in referring the petition, we would... Um, be expecting that they would be aware of the, the kind of deliberation of this committee um, through the, the course of you know, including the original statements by the petitioners right. and so on. As long as that's there, I'm, I'm quite happy with that. Okay, so we'd agree that we then that we'd refer the petition to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee um, for consideration at stage two of that committee scrutiny of the Transport Scotland Bill. Um, and we would want to thank the petitioners and others who. Um, provided submissions on what is clearly continued to be an important issue in, some, in many of our local communities. Is that agreed? Okay, in that case, can I thank everyone for their attendance and I'll close the meeting.